Hello and welcome to the Open Air Podcast. My name is Devang Desai and I'm joined as always by Mr. Simon Bushel halfway through the US Open, Simon. And holy cow, what the hell has happened? Uh, well, I think it's a tale of two draws, isn't it? Because the women's side is still loaded. It's still full of exciting and interesting tennis. The men's side is a bit of a disaster in terms of for the planners <laughs> and for those in the hierarchy and those sitting with all of the money at the USTA. I think they couldn't have scripted this going any worse. The only thing that could be worse is watching Yannick Sinner be dumped out tomorrow. But for the time being, Dev, it's been a very, very exciting tournament. Yeah, I, I didn't think of the organizers and the marketers first, but now I, that, that, that I am thinking about them, it is interesting because they still have a boatload of Americans in here as well, right? On the men's side too. So there is something to lean on, but let's start there because I think this is the main story after the first week of the US Open. Two of the biggest names in the tournament, two of the big names on the men's side out early. Carlos Alcaraz falling to Botich. Van de Van de Zandeschlup and Novak Djokovic falling to the Montreal Maven, Alexei Poprin. Which one was more surprising to you, Simon? It's a really good question because from reading the internet, which is always a bad start, and also listening to tennis commentators, you would believe that Botic's win here was the greatest victory in tennis history, which to me verges on... A little bit disrespectful, <laughs> it has to be said. It it feels like a group of people that have never seen someone win at challenger level and hung around the sort of 50 to 80 range on the tour for as long as he has done. He is an exceptionally good player. And to imply that this is some sort of incredible, massive shock uh, is, I think, a little bit disrespectful to him. Now, obviously, you can throw in the narrative around him wanting to retire, um, just three months ago and all those sort of things. The dude is still 28 years of age, still ranked 70 in the world, still a very, very good player. I think one that, yes, is memeable because of the name and because of his attitude on court, but overall is a very, very good tennis player. And I think it is uh, exciting to watch someone like that play and get a big win. On the flip side of that, I would actually circle Alexei Papyrin's win over Novak Djokovic being more shocking, just given the nature of the titles that Novak Djokovic has won, given him coming off of a gold medal. I think both of us predicting him to make a very deep run in this tournament and perhaps even winning it. I think the manner of which he lost this match and also the manner in which Papyrin played. So I would go with that one over the Alcaraz loss because... Alexei Papyrin was was full marks for it, but Novak Djokovic looked awful, just truly dreadful out there, and uh, in a situation that we haven't seen him look like in a very long time. Yeah, and I, the the Olympics factor is the big one here. Normally, when these matches happen, like after the first set for Alcaraz, I assumed he would come back, and then as the second set sort of emerged, that looked debatable. Even though I think there were some early signs of progress for Carlos in the second set. And yeah, the, the level of flatness is something we haven't seen from him really at this level in a long time. And just to zoom out a bit and understand, I guess, the level of fatigue that accompanies the whole Paris thing, it makes sense that we got this from him. And then I guess that leads to why I was so surprised about Novak a little bit. I mean, this is someone who's done this before. He's He's managed to somehow navigate the highest of emotions, the lowest of emotions. Like I I felt like his experience would have helped him here, but he did really play bad. Like I I think his serve has been an issue for him this whole tournament, even when he was getting through matches and it continued in this one as well. So I guess the surprise is that like when Novak won the third set, I fully believed that he would win in five, you know? And the fact that he wasn't able to come through was shocking. Agreed. What should we say about Alexei Papyrin? Like, I think everyone was, I don't know if clowning that Masters 1000 win in Montreal. I think that's probably a little disrespectful. He did a bit. Although given he the, did a bit, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and when I say people, I mean us. And so <laughs> I'm just trying to cover my ass very briefly here. But it has to be said that was a, a win against the backdrop of the Olympics. It wasn't a loaded field. There was, you know, the extenuating circumstances behind why it occurred. I don't think anyone is saying that he uh, was a fluke for that title now. Did you see his comments after the match when he was asked which one meant more to him? 
that I thought it was very amusing that he chose the Montreal title over winning this match because it was for a title and this was just a third round matchup against a random player. So I thought that was very funny. I don't think he meant it to be uh, throwing shade, but I took it that way. It's good. It led me to think about the opportunities now for the rest of the field. And as we speak, there's some matches going on, including, I think, a bunch of people who have huge opportunities, whether it be your Rublevs or Dimitrovs or Fritzes or Rude. But another part of me thinks, Simon, like if, if Francis Tiafo is to win this tournament, it's better for him that he didn't have to go through Novak because if he, if he were to win that match, he probably would have had to sweat out the, the equivalent of Lake Ontario to accomplish that and he would have been gassed going forward. But now that he doesn't have to play Novak, does his mentality change? Like, I do think this is one of the most interesting men's side of a major in years because we do have a lot of, uh, a lot of variables here. And, and even the favorites have some baggage with them, including Yannick and, and Daniil. Absolutely. I think you could probably make the case, maybe. I think you probably could make this case. Let's go with it and we can always work back from this point. I think you can make the case that everyone who is in the fourth round legitimately believes they could win this title. Despite all of the the roads ahead of them and understanding that it's going to be difficult matches, all of these players have won tour titles, have won at tour level. Um, They probably all feel like given who's out and given the road ahead of them, they're not looking at any of these matchups and feeling like they can't win them. And I think that mostly works because I don't think that Tommy Paul is scared of that Sinner match in the fourth round. I don't honestly know that any of these fourth round matchups would be scared of each other. And I think that makes for some really exciting tennis. All of this against the backdrop that I'm really nervous that Alexander Zverev is going to win this tournament. It (laughs) seems like the road is so open for him. I think everyone's going to look at that top half and feel like it's, you know, the win is going to come out of there, just given that Sinner and Medvedev are there. I'm looking squarely at that bottom half and feeling like, oh God, there's one name in there that stands out above the rest who has a really good chance of winning this now. That was a nervous chuckle for me, but yeah. In in sense in the in the sense of mission stops, Verev, let's put it this way. Who do you have the most faith in remaining? Because I think it's it's Med. It's clearly Daniel Medvedev for me. So I, I feel like that quarterfinal between Sinner and Medvedev, if they get there. The stakes are ridiculously high. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone who he faces is going to is gonna give him a decent matchup. I would have really, really fancied Massetti playing against him, but damn you, Brandon Nakashima. You have to turn into prime Andre Agassi during this tournament, just at a time when we need you most. Best backhand on the men's tour, or maybe at this tournament? Holy cow, what a backhand for Brandon Nakashima. But yeah, you're right. I, I think you also have... The idea of like if it's Rude or Fritz, that that'll be tough for him as well. But yeah, it's also cool because I feel like people like Gregor Dimitrov really believe right now that there's a chance for them to to maybe do something that they thought a few years ago was impossible because of the the stats that are left in the wake of of Novak losing at this point is that we have now for the first time since 2002 uh, a year without the big three winning a title on the men's side, which is insane. Um, I went back and looked at what happened in 2002, Simon, on the ATP. We got some hilarious stuff here, but all four slams are won by different people. But three of those slams, that was their only title, the player that won, which I find (laughs) hilarious and and interesting. But for the sake of trivia, can you name who won the four slams of 2002? Uh, So Leighton Hewitt won Wimbledon. Correct. Uh, is that Roddick? Roddick 2003 at the US Open, isn't it? So it's not Roddick. It's the last hurrah for a great though. It's Saffin, Saffin win in 2002? It's Pistol Pete. Oh, it's Sam- Pete Sampras. Yeah, Sampras. Yeah, Sampras makes sense. French will be the year before Gustavo won. Uh, so this, uh, it wasn't Kitten, right? Kitten won in 2003. Correct. Th- yeah, maybe no, Kitten. No, it was... Uh, yeah. It was another one-hit wonder. No, this one I don't know if you'll get, to be honest. <laughs> oh, man. He's Spanish, and he's not Juan uh, Carlos Ferrero. It wasn't Ferrero. Nope, it's not coming to the front of mind. Albert Costa. 
Right, yes. Damn. And finally, of course. the Australian Open. 2002, he Thomas Johansson? Or is that 2003? 2002, yeah, he beat Murat Safin. I get it right? It is Johansson, right? It is Thomas Johansson, correct. Uh, yeah. Well done. Thomas Johansson got into a lot of video games based on this win. He was in virtual tennis. Uh, he got into games he shouldn't have got into, and I have to applaud him for that. That that random win. 2002 is also the year Fed became a top 10 player. So I found that stat insane. It did make us feel old. Who is the Thomas Johansson of the 2024 US Open men's singles? It might be Jordan Thompson. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it might be it might be Tama himself. Tomo? <laughs> I think it's probably Tommy Paul as opposed to Jordan Thompson. Truth be told. Nah, that's too not that's unfair. Tommy Paul's a better yeah. player, and Thomas Johansson had a, a long, lengthy career of being a top uh top something. <laughs> as we reach the memory banks here of how good Thomas Johansson was as a player. I think he was all right, wasn't he? I think he was a, he hung around the top 30 for a decent amount of time. He made a Wimbledon semi uh quarterfinals a couple times. I think he was seventh in the world at one point. Yeah. So, you know what? I, I, I feel like we are shading Thomas Johnson too much, but Tommy Paul would kill to have his career in the end. And if this is his slam, why not, right? Absolutely. What do you make of the other damning statistic which came out of this tournament, which was no Spanish men into the third round since 1999? That is an absolutely remarkable stat. It speaks to, obviously, the longevity of how good Spanish tennis has been on the men's side. It also speaks to the fact that it helps when you have both Rafael Nadal and Carlos Alcaraz. And, you know, the list goes on and on. David Ferrer, Juan Carlos Ferrero. As you previously mentioned, Albert Costa as well. There is just a long, 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 long list of exceptionally good Spanish male players. Feels like a bit of a transition period, doesn't it? And it speaks to the fact that since 1999, that that is an incredibly long time ago to not have a man in the third round. That is in some ways more crazy to think about than even the big threes Grand Slam record since 2002. And now you look and you can't miss an Italian, basically, if you look any in any section of an ATP draw, which is something that wasn't happening in the past either. Yeah, it does feel like a bit of a change. You see Australia extremely well, re- well represented here, France as well. The UK, I, I wonder as well if this maybe harkens to the power of the slams and those federations, Simon, um, the countries with the most resources being able to invest in the depth of talent they have because... I mean, the U.S. is obviously not two or three deep. They've got a lot of guys. But I saw this was the first first top 20 matchup between two men at a slam, two American men, since 2002 when Shelton and Tiafo played. That is insane to me as well. But now they've got, it looks like six guys, seven guys, uh, potentially. Nakashima will be back in the top, top 20 in no time, I think. Yep, party like it's 2002, Dev. It's happening. We're going back. What is old is new again. Get your cargo pants out. Austin, pa- uh, <laughs> Austin Powers. Uh, Austin yeah. Powers is back, baby. Shagadelic, baby. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Get your blonde highlights. Center parting. That's coming back. Uh, what is old is new. Post 9-11 hysteria is back, baby. <laughs> okay. Um, the only thing we need now is long sleeved t-shirt and then short sleeved t-shirt over the top of it and visors. Yeah. And we're good. Good to go. Whew. Man, what a time. Okay. Just a word on the men's side before we wrap up for your boy, Dev, Gabriel Diallo. Ooh. Good tournament for him. And yeah. I think turned a few heads of people that perhaps are only tuning in for the Grand Slams. Came through qualifying, had a really good win against Jaime Manar, wins against Arthur Fies in, in the battle of the, the young phenoms. Goes out to Tommy Paul in a very respectable match, which he had his chances in. He absolutely had his chances in that. Just a, a quick word from you on on the young Canadian. Playing Munar, someone with so much more experience at this level, I really enjoyed the fact that he went for his shots. So many errors, but also extremely um, fun to, to watch Bush. And I think this bodes well for the future. It also, I mean, he played Arthur Fees. He's older than him. He's older than Fees by a couple of years. And I think that's 
that's what happens when you do the collegiate route. And this this win, this this two wins, I think, brings him really close to the top 100, which I think is important for him in, in the sense of avoiding qualifiers going forward. So really good week from him. And I mean, after a disastrous showing from the rest of the Canadians, we needed something to, to be proud of. And he was the one because overall, Simon, not great from Canada. Yeah, I think the last said about what Felix Ogelia seem phoned into this <laughs> yeah. tournament is probably probably best. We wish him well. Ice up, son. We need you back. Come on. And Chapo lost to Bot- Botic, all caps. And after what he did, I guess that was we all knew what what happened if Carlos had played Chapo. So, in the sense of us being spared from that, thanks. I guess it's true. Should we turn our attention to the women in a? Thoroughly, let's do it. yeah, let's do it. Completely loaded fourth round section, Dev. Any matchup that you pick is pretty much fantastic. It's fantastic. I I'm going to take credit, Simon. I saw early Paula Bedosa here against Taylor Townsend, and I thought to myself, I think she's going to make a run here based on her draw. It included Krejcikova, who's nursing a, a victory hangover of sorts, and the perpetually cursed Maria Zachary. So I felt like Pedosa had a shot here to make a run, and I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. But you're totally right in the sense of stacked. Um, I thought Elise Merton's keys, Madison Keys, was a phenomenal match. And I want to shout out Elise Merton's for bringing it consistently year over year and also being the 33rd seed, which I like. Looks funky and weird. Um that was great in Paulini. So, I mean, if she were to win it here, this match between Muchova and Paulini is like the two people we want to win the most who have probably suffered the most heartache. There's a lot of storylines here. I mean, you got Coco Goff, who is trying to shake some some poor performances, playing Emma Navarro, who's been in form this summer. And then Iga Sviantek, who I think you thought might have maybe had a slip up potential against Pavlenchenkova, but she she looked okay there as well. Bush, who are you looking at? Yeah, and that's before you even get to the 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 luscious locks of and luscious bandana of Diana Schneider as well, who is uh, <laughs> yeah. wrapping communism everywhere, hammer and sickle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We love the bandana. Um, I mean, Jess Pegular as well. If you, if you, if I mentioned the the USTA not feeling great about the ATP side, they've got to be loving the WTA side because they have strong American flags still going. They have Coco Golf and Emma Navarro, which has which has I don't want to say bad blood in it, but it certainly has an, an element of revenge looking out for Coco Golf on that side of things. Uh, you have comebacks. Obviously, you have Caroline Wozniacki turning back the clock as well. You have. Um, just so many things. And Iga Svantec, of course, as you mentioned, still in this tournament. I thought there was a potential slip up, potential banana scan against Pavlyuchenkova. You called it. Didn't happen. Kind of looked mildly like it might be the case for the first 35 minutes. And then it very quickly became apparent that it wasn't. But Dev, you mentioned it. I think that is that Makova Paolini section and, and those two players. I think we both desperately want them to see a major just because of obviously the year for Paolini and the career of Mukova. Just a really, really good tournament. And every single section has great matchups. And I think you're eating well if you're a fan of the WTA here. You are. Curious what you thought from Sabalenka so far, Simon, because she felt like the favorite coming in. She had to play at midnight thanks to some curse scheduling and also I mean, maybe good scheduling. I don't know when they could have put that faux Shelton match that wouldn't have um, impacted another match just based on how long it was going to go. But she dealt with that after a really shaky opening set against Alexandrova. Mertens is a tricky one though. Like I feel like this, these next couple of matches, should she get through, like you're talking the winner of Shang Vekic, which should be an absolute barn burner. You got talking about bad blood. Remember the Olympics? <laughs> That's that should be absolutely amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, maybe we got bad blood. Got like an old Taylor Swift <laughs> yeah. reference is not appropriate here in any capacity. Boo. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Boo that man. Um, <laughs> Sabalenka's look fine to me. I think there was. I think if you thought that she's going to win this title before the tournament, I don't think there's anything that you've seen here which would disprove that. I think she's looked completely. Completely fine. I think I don't think Mertens is a big problem for her. I really don't. As much respect that I can pay to Elise Mertens, who are a player that we both mm-hmm. have a huge amount of respect for and, and love immensely, but 
Sabalenka is on a different level at the moment. I still think she wins this title. I really do. She looked she looked great, and of course has that Sabalenka uh, double, the mini Sabalenka in the crowd as well, dressed like her. So yes, she has good vibes going as well. Potentially, if she, if she does win, it's it's you beat Mertens, then you beat winner of Zhang Vekic, then you beat potentially let's say Coco Goff, and then you beat potentially let's say Iga Swiatek. That's a hell of a road to uh, to another slam. She'll be full value for that. Yeah, she will. But Shviotek has to get through Samson over as well, right? Which is a, it's a it's a, a matchup which has got its well, he, problems as here's well. Here's something. Here's something for it. Even with Savalenka dropping a set and and those conditions aside, I feel less confident about Iga. You know, and she I think she has less star power in her section of the draw. But I feel like Diana Schneider and Jess Pegula have been extremely informed players this summer, and Wozniacki might be. I mean, is she the most dangerous, not unseated? Yes, definitely. But I mean, it's it's funny when the draw came out, it seemed like there were so many other things to pinpoint maybe in in and around that section, whether it be Rabakina's health um, or or looking at a potential quarterfinal against, uh, or, uh, against Naomi Osaka. But the fact that Wozniacki has looked this good, I, I think it's, it's a bit of an eye-opener as well because from both wings, especially on the hard courts. She feels like someone who has the ability to hit with a Sabalenka as well. Yeah, I agree with you. Wouldn't it be a turnout for the books, Devang, during an Olympic year that we get the most random two winners on of, at the US Open? It definitely could happen. I don't think it will happen. I think there's still enough. I think the, the top players in the WTA are, are still playing well enough that I do back them to make very deep runs in this tournament and for, you know, I think one of the favorites to win it. That said, if we are sitting in a world where the men's side is won by Tommy Paul and the women's is run by Paula Pedosa. Why are you laughing? See? You... Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, not a, that's not a ridiculous no. situation to predict given all the things that have happened and how compressed the schedule has been and just everything that we've seen so far in this tournament, I could certainly believe it. Also imagine the synergy there. Tommy, Paul, Paula, Bedosa. That's fantastic. We got to stop laughing when we mentioned some of these names and, and then slam winner. But I think this is what the culture has made us do um, in that big three era, that cursed era. Bring us back the era of Thomas Johansson winning slams. Damn it. Um, I, I will ask for your picks then, your revised picks. I, I think I picked Novak, so I'm going to have to pick again on the men's side. But on the women's side, are you sticking with Sabalenka or are you changing? It sounds like you're not changing. I'm not changing. I still think Sabalenka wins this title on the women's side. Yep. And men, are you going Sin Man? I'm picking Alexander Zverev. I think he's going to win this tournament. What? <laughs> Mask <laughs> off? Mask off? Is, is this a, res, a reverse jinx fall on your sword thing? I don't want him to win. I just think he will win. <laughs> wow. I'm shaken to my core. Um, I, I'm going to switch my women's pick to Paolo Medosa, unironically. I want to see it. <laughs> I want to see it. I want to see her soar like a phoenix post since he passed. Um, so I'm going Medosa. And then on the men's side, I think the center method of quarterfinal if we get it, knock on wood, we get it. It's going to be a knockdown, knockdown, drag him out, leaving both of them phased. So we're going to get a slim, uh, a winner from another feel good force. It's Grigor Dimitrov. Bold pick doing it live as he's playing a match that he could lose, but I'm picking Dimitrov to win, Simon. I think everyone would love it, would they not? You see, during the course of the week, they yeah. asked a bunch of players who they would most like to see on Love Island, and Grigor Dimitrov was the overwhelming choice <laughs> on that. So, clearly, fan favorites on. It checks he out. is a fan favorite among the players. Will he t- ride that emotion to winning this U.S. Open title? I don't. I don't think he's looked that good. I have to say, despite the cleanliness of his no, wins. No, <laughs> he also. He looks quite tired at times. I, I listen. I, I I want anyone from that section to take out Zverev and win. And I have a feeling Medvedev's spinner. You know, Med Med's fitness is an underrated quality about him. And I love his doggedness. Like I do think he'd get up to take out Zverev in the final. So like I I won't discount him. But 
Dimitrov also doesn't look 100% like health-wise as we're watching him against Rublev, who... Have you noticed Bush when Rublev is yelling at his box, often his box is as confused as all we all are? Like, isn't that concerning that they don't know what he's yelling about? Yeah, it's not very enjoyable to watch him play at the moment, <laughs> given it's all bad, of the man. It's horrible. histrionics that comes out of the, the Russian's mouth. I think... Uh, I was listening to Naomi Brody, who was being interviewed on the BBC, and she referred to it as just a player that has, you uh, as a player who you can tell from watching from the outside, wants it so badly that is unable to control the emotions that are coming out of him. Yeah. Like it's it's obvious when you say it like that, but at the same time, this is not a young kid anymore. This is not someone who is still trying to learn his learn his craft and is still new to the tour. This is how many time quarter finalists is he at a major? Eight, nine? It's a lot anyway, to the point where the expectations are that I don't think it's I don't think it's great when you're continuing to throw your toys out the pram and completely lose your head that you think that's gonna help you getting over the line to a semi final. Maybe try something else at this point. Bam. We'll leave it there. When we come back after the break, parting shots, we talk about outfits, the good, the bad, the fugly, Dominic team, sinners, doping scandal, plus Jess Pegula takes a subway. All of that coming up next on Open Era. Welcome back to the Open Era Podcast. Simon, well into the US Open. And you know what that means. It means we've seen a lot of fits, a lot of outfits, good, bad, really bad. But I think Naomi Osaka's outfit stole the show. A lot of comments on this this frills, no frills. I don't know what you want to call it. Puke green, um, the green mistake. But uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and you left out the most important part was the bow on the back of it as well. Wrapped up like like a present. Sure, I guess. I thought it was all right. I kind of liked it. I don't know why it got some of the hate that it did. The color. You know, <laughs> if it was any other color, I would have been okay with it. Just something about that color that literally made me sick. And, it, I, you know, I love Naomi Osaka, big fan, but... um. I don't know what Pantone color that is. I don't know if you could buy that legally or you have to get it on the black market because it's so hideous. But no, I'm not in. I'm not in it at all. Did you see the outfit, the the Jess Pagula fit, the Adidas purple thing? It's terrible. It's okay, so <laughs> I, I. It's worse than that. It's and that's the thing. Like I, as much as I berating the uh, the Nike green puke fit, that Adidas thing, the purple thing. It's maybe the worst thing I've ever seen, and I'm not even being like clownish about it. I mean this full, full heartedly. Against the backdrop, of course, that we are clearly not the target audience that they're pitching to here. Um, I don't, I didn't, I didn't care for it. Put it that way. <laughs> and it's true. And I, I, I'm asking people every day that I see, do you like this? And they're all saying no. So that must mean the bowling works. <laughs> I did, however quite enjoy the Ben Shelton shirt, the on-running one. Yeah. It's doing yeah. the rounds. I believe it's sold out, I saw. On? Listen, on is making not not bad stuff in the tennis space. I never thought it was possible to merge the two audiences of 14-year-olds and 90-year-olds, but somehow they have, <laughs> they have they did they've walked the thin line. <laughs> the Venn diagram <laughs> that would never be one circle. They did it, baby. There's a there's a period of time, wasn't there, um, where I was people doing the old classic Zuma or Boomer who wore it better, like between <laughs> between the Crocs and the cargo trousers and all those kind of things. Which is maybe we were maybe I'm incorrect on this in the sense that it's actually been a market for a long time. It's true. I, uh, I just generally like the Hugo Boss stuff. I wonder, like, are people wearing that? Are they copping that at their local tennis warehouse? Do you think it's going to become a mainstream thing? I don't think so. Hugo Boss is... It's interesting if you walk around the stores, though. If you go into any big mall in North America, you do see uh, Matteo Berrettini plastered in underwear all across the front of their yeah. stores. So, <laughs> yeah. How many, yeah, I wonder. I would love to do a poll. Speaking of polls, I'd like to yell at people, hey, do you know who this is? As they walk by <laughs> a nearly naked Matteo Berrettini for research. 
It's so interesting that they chose perhaps the two most handsome men on tour in Taylor Fritz and Matteo Berrettini to be their two um, people they market around. I feel like they know what they're doing. I don't know whether or not that's that's a good thing or not, but they certainly have an audience they're trying to cater to. Yeah. It's it's given off Abercrombie and Fitch early 2000s vibes, which is upsetting. So we'll leave, we'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> okay, Dominic Team Simon. Last Grand Slam match at a place that means a lot to him. Of course... The winner of the 2020 U.S. Open, Dominic Team, lost his final match to Ben Shelton. Simon, what do you think of this? I'm glad they gave them Ash. I did think the it was a bit weird because it was in the daytime, so it felt like a bit like they were playing him off um, Oscar style when he was doing his speech at the end. But Dominic Team gave it his all. Clearly loved the shit out of this game and was really good at it. But like like some greats before him, his body wouldn't allow him to keep going. Really glad he got that one, though. I know it's it sounds kind of ha- ha- um, hollow saying this when, when he's having to stop early, but it is really important, I think, in, in the sense of like tennis history that I think Dominic Team got one because he pushed a lot of these guys to the very limits and won some awesome matches. Well, I think he's an interesting person as well, simply because from, from a personal standpoint, from a podcast standpoint, I think we we were around at a time of watching him I mean, this this podcast kind of bookends his career in some ways, the top end of his career. Because I remember yeah. I remember talking yeah. about that ascent and like distinctly remember myself saying that I thought he was the best player in the world. I thought he was award number one in a period of time when Roger Federer, Rafa Nadal, and Novak Djokovic and Andy Murray were still playing, like and still at the top of the game. That's how good I think Dominic Team was for the period of time that he ascended to the top of the sport, 2019, 2020, uh, even 2018. You can make the case as well. Like he was. He was like he 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 was the dude, and I think that's somewhat lost on the fact that we've seen so much of his career derailed because of injury, and the fact that he was kind of a late riser as well. He had to work very very hard to make that transition between being a, a someone would say a clay court specialist to being able to play on all surfaces. I think he is going to get unfortunately lost to the annals of history. I think he's going to be a bit of an afterthought on the men's side, and I think that's a bit of a shame because he was so so good and the downfall from there because of injury and what we've been robbed of i think is really really um sad i think it's really really sad because i think we all enjoyed watching him play and it was nice to get a a send-off against uh a young kid in ben shelton who was very gracious magnanimous in terms of how he um encouraged the crowd to, to wave team off as well so we've lost a good one there Hundred um, percent. Quickly, I, I wondered who do you think leaves a larger legacy in the game, Del Potro or Team? I don't know. Probably Team. I wonder if if Delpo not being European pushes edges him out for me because I think the other th- other thing about being an outlier during this era is that literally he was all European people winning these these titles and Delpo kind of managed to disrupt that. Uh, and he was kind of a, an outlier in the sense of like s- the size and style of him. Like, I wonder if that pushes him slightly ahead, but I think it's an interesting question because they're not in that Vavrinka's tier, right? No. So I, I think they're they're a step below, but food for thought for our listeners out there. But I think that's an interesting question as well, is that what, what do you pick? Do you pick the heights that someone achieved in their career? Because I think we would we would both claim... I think rightly as well. I don't think this is controversial to say that Vavrinka's peaks are much higher than, than Team and Del Potro's, just given that he ascended to be yeah. the greatest player in human history to win his three grand slams. Um, but I think <laughs> I think Team and Del Potro had more longevity in their career in terms of being at the top and winning matches in that position. Yeah, an interesting one, an interesting comparison point. For, you know, three outstanding, excellent players, but very different in their own right. Yannick Sinnerbush surviving, not looking good at times, but making it through when when his peers were not. Obviously dealing with the doping stuff, though, uh, in front of the cameras, doing some press. I saw ESPN had like a big sit down with him and they went through it all. But um, I did think Med, as usual, had some interesting comments on the doping stuff. He did. You see the ESPN sit down with him was referred to as a presidential puffball sit down interview, which <laughs> yeah. I thought was really funny. I can't remember who said it. I apologize that I didn't bring it with me. But I think Danny Medvedev had some interesting comments on Yannick Sinner 
just sort of, I think, honestly, echoing a lot of the same things that we were saying on the podcast last week, just around the idea of, by all accounts, the the rules were followed. And then the question comes down to whether or not you believe the rules are fair and whether or not there is equality in those uh, in how it's set up. He ref- a very, very specific thing that he referred to is whether or not a player ended up with cocaine in their system, which I did raise my eyebrows slightly, but I understand the point that he was trying to make on it. Um, and in short, that version being, if they come to you and uh, the test is that being and say, we found cocaine in your system and you're like, well, what what the fuck? I don't know where, I don't know where that could have came from. Then they'll just suspend you because you don't have a good case to go um ready like you don't have it available to you and in that kid situation you are you are punished uh which again makes this whole thing with sinner seem so so convenient that you just had this perfect excuse ready to go and you knew you were ready on the spot and all your team yeah. was ready to go yeah i don't know man it seems all a bit a bit too convenient for me Having some more time to think about this, like a part of me is like, well, isn't this exactly how it should work for all athletes where th- this thing happens and they, they're like, oh, I didn't do it and I'm going to prove I didn't do it. And their name isn't bleeded out there and pumped out there when there's no um, no guilt, no uh, conf- confirmation of guilt yet. So they go through their appeals, they go through all the, the processes and then it's, it's found out that they're cleared and then it all comes out. Like that's typically how you would want it to go, I guess, but it never does go that way. So that's why we're raising our eyebrows. But like in the sense of how do you properly enforce doping? This is like a textbook case of a success. You could spin it that way, couldn't you? Like the idea of, mm-hmm. yeah, we caught him, but it turns out we went through all these things to prove that he was clean and he was we didn't have to tell you any of this. Maybe that's me just being pu- fully dared Cahill pilled, but I don't know. I, I think you're right, though. I, I think it's kind of the point that I was trying to get at last week, which is that I think the system worked. I think what they were, when they were writing down on the whiteboard and they sort of had the goals that they were trying to achieve, I think they wanted to keep players anonymity intact if they'd failed a drugs test, give them the opportunity to um, to sort of counter that and appeal that in a space where they would have time and available to do so, and then to allow the players to keep playing until the resolution of it. And I think that everything happened here correctly. It's it's more to the question of whether or not you... Yeah, there's the two parts. Whether or not you actually believe what Sinner is saying in the camp and whether or not you have faith in the system. And then there's, of course, the fair, the question of equality and fairness of whether or not everyone has the ability to, to defend themselves and can get uh, the same legal advice and the same legal um, uh, defenses that Sinner had available to him and whether or not you could do it on time as well. All of those things are, are very up in the air. I, I agree. And there's other things like why they waited to fire those guys that were his physio and the massage till now and not right away, like. I guess there's optics and other things involved and, and how it would look. But yeah, I we'll see. I, I do think it's interesting to think about the process and, and how it works because obviously there has been so many other tennis players or not so many at least, but more than a handful of players who haven't been afforded the same sort of um, anonymity during the process, which I think has been key. And that is key for everyone going forward if this is truly to work. Um so yeah, let's see how it moves forward in terms of the case. What's next, Simon? What's next is uh, Chrissy Everett commenting on Carolina Makova. Quote, she wants to play like a guy. She wants to play like a guy. Oh, These guys have bigger serves than the women. They have better volleys for the most part. They move a little bit better, close quote, which prompted Ange Dubur to write back, Makova is an amazingly talented player. She doesn't have to be a guy to have a great serve, volley, or movement. Can we please stop stereotyping based on gender? Dev, let me ask you this question. What the fuck was Chrissy Everett thinking on this? Uh, it's bad, man. I have a bad update on the, the power rankings or tennis commentators. Cliff, Cliff Drysdale has surpassed Chris <laughs> Everett in the power rankings. I didn't think I'd see the day, but Cliffy has moved ahead of Chrissy in the tennis power rankings for commentators. During the course of the week, I uh, went with a colleague of mine to go and pick up a table 
um, there was a there's a story behind this, I promise you. And the guy that we picked it up from was the I could not have picked a more perfect embodiment of a tennis fan of a guy living in a in a in a beautiful house in the west side of Vancouver who was wearing a Roger Federer hat watching the US Open. <laughs> and I was chatting to him about it because I had some time while like my my colleague was taking the table apart and putting it in the car. And he I he did not know anything about what was like the player's um backstory or anything to do with it. He only watched the tennis and I think when you look at it through that lens, you only hear what ESPN want you to hear. Like, yeah, there's mm-hmm. the, he, like he he literally. This is a guy who watched every Grand Slam and every Masters. He didn't know that Yannick Sinner had failed a drugs test. And like, that is remarkable to me. Holy cow! Did you at least drop an Open Era CD in his mailbox? <laughs> <laughs> is that how you share it? Podcasts, by the way, I'm not sure. I couldn't think of someone who would less like to want to listen to us. <laughs> truth be told, I just, I just gently encouraged him to listen to the tennis podcast and moved on. Hey, buddy, open a newspaper, maybe. <laughs> How about that? Something which more fits his target demographic. Yes. <laughs> okay. Video review, Simon. Yeah. So a couple of big policy changes that we didn't touch on going into the U.S. Open. Obviously, the free fan movement the what i like to call it is the the us open schengen zone if you want to use that kind of analogy here uh Very which good. i think has actually been fairly successful just reading some stories about it during the course of the week and of course the biggie var is here video replay is in place and it's already a farce so this uh, match between uh, Beatrice Adamaya and and Kalinskaya took place uh, we had video review, which, honest to God, looks like the most ridiculous thing in the world in a tennis tournament to watch two grown men sitting side by side in a command center bunker, which looks like, you know, a tech bro's basement. <laughs> <laughs> we go to video review for the double bounce. It is reviewed by the video umpire. It comes back without a change. Anyone in the world who watches the same replay can understand that the point was clearly for Kalinskaya, and yet the rule is upheld, which is to say that you can put video replay into the system, but there is always going to be a level of human fallibility in this whole process. We didn't uh, cover this, but... Great Britain's great shame, Jack Draper, Simon, is making a run here after his shameful actions uh, a few weeks ago in Cincinnati. How are you taking this? Well, let's just move on from Jack Draper. <laughs> no, I think he's, again, he's he is a, a player on that side of things. He's got a really, really good chance as well to, to like, this guy could be a semi-finalist very easily just given yeah. his given his pathway. He's not going to be afraid of Mahak. He's not going to be afraid of Dimonor, and he's not going to be afraid of Thompson either. Like I think you turn around and you have a semi-final, which is Danny Medvedev against Jack Draper. I think, you know, I wouldn't raise my eyebrows at that at all, given where we are at the moment. Yeah, and I, I'm obviously joking about the Jack Draper stuff, but the aftermath of that incident, in in the sense of like getting something that is helpful to fixing things, didn't seem to be top of mind for everyone involved. Like after this, it's like, oh yeah, like we still have the people involved who are not going to get it right all the time, and it's still going to lead to events like we saw in that Hadad Maya Kali in the Sky match. So that's well said, Simon. And finally, Jesse from the block. <laughs> Question mark? So there was a video circulating during the course of the week, which the US Open put out of Jess Pagula taking the subway to uh, Flushing and to the US Open. And this was, I thought it was a good video. Honestly, like before I get into, it was good. before I get into ripping this and <laughs> perhaps being cynical about the whole thing, I thought it was quite, it was entertaining. And I think it gave a good insight uh, into who Pagula is. Um, however, I don't believe this for a second. The way that she was trying to interact with those ticket barriers and the way that she was trying to navigate the subway, it looked like she had never been on public transit in her life. She hasn't been below ground in the United States is what you're saying. 
the way that she was talking about it implied to me that it's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes I go on this this train when it's too busy to take the car <laughs> at some tournaments. Nah, that's unfair. I don't think she was doing that. But it was it was <laughs> it doesn't sound real at all. Yeah. It seemed a bit uh a bit ham fisted to me, this did. She's riding a wave, you know. I think she's now that there's a more hated billionaire perhaps on the tour in <laughs> Navarro, I think I think JPEG's riding a popularity wave. Do you think this is a psyop? Do you think Jess Pagula has <laughs> yeah. had, ever taken public transit before in her life? I'm going to say she has. I'm going to say she's taken it abroad, you know? Like, she's not taken the subway maybe that often in the United States, but in her travel, she has. Because where public transit is better, I feel like these kind of things where you're like, yeah, I'll take it to the tournament instead of the car. Everyone's like, yeah, that makes total sense when you live in a functioning city, unlike... The majority of North America, it seems. It is true. It is very true. Before we wrap putting shots, I think it is worth noting just on the rule changes that we didn't cover it last week as an addendum. I think this late night match policy is working okay. The idea that A little if it's, bit, yeah. If it, yeah. the discretion is to move it, if it's, uh, I believe the policy is basically if the match is going on later than 11.15, then it's up to the discretion of the umpire and the tournament director of whether or not they want to move the match to another time just to prevent it going until three in the morning. I think this is a good policy overall and something that I'd like to see enforced in other places. I like it a lot. I, it feels like they put some thought into it and, and found a, a, a solution. I know it's not going to appease everyone, but it's something that clearly shows they're working towards something as opposed to what we've seen, I think, from some of the other slams when it comes to some rigid decision making. So good on them. Agreed, Simon. Okay. Two challenges remaining, sir. What do you got? My two challenges remaining is the run up to the British Columbia election, Devang. And oh, yeah. Yeah. What an interesting time in British Columbia <laughs> politics. So for those who don't know, which is probably the vast majority of our audience, the runners and riders are the British Columbia New Democratic Party. You hear them referred to as the NDP, who are currently the government. And they are facing the British Columbia Conservative Party that is read, led by a guy called John Roosted. The interesting part about this is that John Roosted used to be a member of the uh, British Columbia Liberal Party, but was kicked out of the party by their current leader, Kevin Falcon, for uh, many things, including being a climate change denier and also um, the some inflammatory comments that had been made uh, in regards to um, race-based uh, accusations and many other things, it has to be said. However, this has come full circle with John Rooster now being the head of the BC Conservatives and Kevin Falcon having to go cap in hand to him during the course of the week after the BC um, Liberal Party had fallen apart completely. He disbanded the campaign and then asked for support from the BC Conservatives. So you have a situation where the official opposition no longer exists as a party, which is absolutely wild. I can't think of anything like this in the political history of me watching uh, either a place that I've lived or watching abroad. So the government's in place. There is an official opposition, but their party no longer exists. And... Who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> Canada is riding an extreme wave of right-wing populism <laughs> that may carry this BC Conservative Party into power in four weeks' time. Hold up, Bush. First things, my man's name is Kevin Falcon. <laughs> it is. And he didn't oh, win God. with that kind God of name. Democracy is dead. You had everything handed Democracy to you on a plate. is dead that is a wild story um thank you shared a link with me in our chat that helped me understand what was happening but yeah what a shit show the canada's biggest provinces just utter shit shows ontario bc collect your boys canada what is going on here it's about to be one hell of a rightward swing in canada across the whole well i don't, I don't know if that's actually true i don't think ontario has well, the ability to go anymore right wing yeah and i mean with the incoming likely conservative win at the federal level, maybe we'll see a swing back eventually, hopefully, to counteract. But I don't know. Um, it's pretty bleak at the moment. I 
I'm going to shout out a book, an audio book I listened to over a weekend that was very long, but it's called 22 Murders. It's about those, about the, the mass shooting in Nova Scotia in 2020. Uh, and it was about the, the shooter himself and the community and, and the RCMP's utter failure, um, both before and during the incident. But yeah, just an absolutely harrowing um, listen. In my case, I listened to the book, but one of those ones where I started it on a Friday and I ended it on a Sunday just because I was so into it. But um, the RCMP Bush, read into it, Canadian friends. What the F? What the F have we done here? What are they doing? Reform them now. Arguably disband them. Um, You should disband them, it sounds like. it. so, geez Louise. But yeah, 22 murders. Check it out. There is a saying that echoes around the east side of Vancouver here, which is, don't trust the RCMP, don't trust the BPD. I think that speaks volumes for how a lot of these institutions are seen in this part of the world. Yeah, and uh, institutional um, systemic issues that plague these these organizations that are so so um, entrenched in Canadian life and society. It's pretty wild, but um, I think that's it. Simon, believe it on that. Note, a reminder, we are on patreon.com forward slash open air pause. Join us there, get the show ad free, get it early on Sundays. Plus, join the best tennis discord in the land where we're talking tennis all the time, including right now during the U.S. Open. And that is it for us this week. For producer Greg on the ones and twos and for Simon, thank you so much for listening to Open Era. We'll talk to you next week.